Wow, this is quite a crowd. Thank you all for coming out. Um, before we begin, I, I want to acknowledge that Fresno State is on the traditional homeland of the Yokut and Mono peoples. Um, I also want to thank the MFA faculty and specifically Jefferson Beavers and Lisa Galvez for making this, allowing this to happen. So, um, yeah, a lot of applause. Excellent. I see so many wonderful writers and mentors in the audience. It's always, uh, I don't know, it's great. It makes me happy. So tonight we have a really talented group of first year writers um, who are going to be sharing their poetry, nonfiction, and fiction with you all. Um, for some of them, it is their first time ever reading. Um, and I don't know, it's just this really exciting, exciting event the SGLA puts on every year, Rough Drafts. I was part of it in my first year, and it was, um, yeah, I don't know, it just, it helped me get comfortable in front of a microphone. So I kind of wanted to, to have it in a more laid back environment. I thought these steps looked nice, so it looks exactly as I envisioned. Anyway, uh, let's get started. Our first reader is going to be Sharon. Uh, Sharon K. McLean finds impetus to write from her unconventional childhood growing up in the beach cities of Southern California, alchemizing a painful past into healing and beauty. Themes prevalent in her writing range from trauma and grief to forgiveness and hope. Welcome, Sharon. Hello, all. And first of all, thanks to James for organizing this event and to all of you for coming out to hear us. I'm reading a couple of vignettes from a longer essay about my sister, Teresa. This first very short vignette is titled Phone Call. It's a few minutes after 8 a.m., and I've just poured a cup of coffee. The beige-toned office suite is quiet, empty, since no one else has yet arrived. The ring of my office phone splits the silence. Steve's voice sounds off-key, unfamiliar. Words tumble awkwardly out of his mouth. He stammers that you have passed out and they are trying to revive you. He'll call me back with updates. An odd thickness infiltrates the space around me, a surreal ringing in my ears. The office horizon tilts. As the phone conversation loops on repeat in my head, I zombie walk down to the second floor for a meeting with a colleague. Her cubicle is in a large open office suite where lots of people are quietly working. My cell phone rings, and when Steve tells me to sit down, I know. I know you are gone. The ringing in my ears burns, then detonates. I am dismantled by a nauseating collapse of all that I know. Then, the banshee shrieks gush out while the floor rises to catch my limp body. The primal death wails engulf the sterile office space. And this final piece is titled, Final Act. Pariah status, I am not part of the inner sanctum of your death day. Decimated, I cannot find the capacity to drive up to your house where I would be shunned by some. Excruciating, fuck them all. You are my Teresa, my soulmate. I know you better than all of them. The next day it hits me. I will find you. Wherever you went after they took you away, this becomes my quest, our reunion, before incineration. Frantic phone calls to coroners, health departments, funeral homes in two different counties. You have slipped away, a disappearing act. Then a chance phone call connects me with a funeral home in the foothills where they are prepping you for the pyre. Google Maps says it's only 39 miles from our house, but we can't find the place. We traverse and circumscribe the two square miles that edge Highway 41 in the center of Oakhurst. I'm still trying to keep up with you, even now. Finally, tucked away in the back of a small shopping center, between a hobby shop and an antique store, we find you. 
up the short stretch of crumbling concrete stairs, precarious wrought iron railing unstable in my hand, empty lobby, soundless on this Monday afternoon. Dust particles floating, suspended in sunlit ether. Dull blue shag carpet, white chalky walls. A pile of cheap teddy bears on the table in the corner. A paltry offering for the grief stricken. You would have hated the gaudy colored, poorly made plush toys with sad plastic eyes. But I take a red one, desperate for any relief. The funeral director leads us into the dimly lit viewing area. My eyes struggle to adjust to the plum-hued atmosphere. Fake twilight illuminating what looks like a cabaret theater setting or a nightclub. A grouping of chairs face the front of the room where there is a stage of sorts. A torch singer or magician might step out at any minute to launch into their show. You would find humor here. But the place feels too quiet, suffocating, like the air has been sucked out, leaving a stifling hush. And there is an unsettling chill in the atmosphere reminding me of why you are here. Heavy black curtains border the stage, and then I notice the small table draped with burgundy fabric that skims the floor. A soft glow from a small spotlight reveals the outline of your form under an illumined white shroud. I half expect your body to levitate, the climax of a magician's routine in this strange lounge scene. I approach the stage and make my way to you, carefully lifting the corners of the coverture, revealing your face and torso. The rough edges of my breath stiffen and slice my rib cage. I gaze downward, the familiar smooth peach-hued skin, dark lashes, skimming lids, full brows, the gulliher, turned up nose, familiar lips, but too pale. You look good, I tell you, but your chilled cheek startles my hand. That familiar aroma, your personal scent imbued with a hint of lily of the valley, but now, a vexing chemical scent completes this olfactory triad. A cascade of soft auburn hair frames your face, spilling onto your shoulders. I want some of your hair. I ask you if it's okay. Larry hands me his Swiss army knife, scissors open. I cautiously cut a small piece, afraid you might get mad. Then I greedily cut a longer tress from the back, where it won't be missed placing it ever so carefully in my purse, a secret treasure. I hold your cold hands. I know them by heart. Short nails painted bright red, something so elemental about the hands as if they are the true means to confirm identity. You wear a random t-shirt from a 10K race and orange running shorts, a costume change after the complete shutdown of your body during your final free fall. There is no applause at the end of this show, no encore, and I am not ready to leave you. Cannot fathom what comes next. Want to take you with me. But Larry leads me out and away. Sun slams my throbbing eyes as we tread down the precarious stairs to the parking lot. Red teddy bear hangs from my hand. When Marianne tries to see you only two hours later, you are already gone, launched into oblivion. Thank you. Whoa, that was amazing. I, I uh, got to be in an undergrad workshop with Sharon. I thought the writing didn't get better then, but it just keeps getting better. Good to go. Uh, next up, we have Sarith Hawk, who is a first-year MFA student with an emphasis on creative nonfiction. A self-described donut kid, Sarith is writing about her lifelong experience with her family-run shop and exploring how donuts have shaped Cambodian-American identity. 
Sarif was a journalist, but these days she's taking, the, taking care of the family business and eating lots of donuts for inspiration. <laughs> Welcome, Sarif. Well, this is my first reading. I'm one of those. So um, if you guys can just give me a quick picture, like a, like you look really happy to see me. Like, <laughs> awesome, perfect. This is for my souvenir, okay. All right, so this piece is called Secondhand Smoke. <clears throat> The alarm goes off at 2 a.m. The alarm has always gone off at 2 a.m. And I mean off, off with her head off. A signal for my fractured psyche to brace for the maddening orderly disorder, the corrosive, insidious, evenly spaced violence of the second hand snooze button. It creeps in every 2 a.m. without fail an incessant buzzing, worming its way into the storyline of my dreams. Set it off. A sinister jingle is the warning shot, and the urgency builds and builds and builds. Each successive tone losing another layer of decorum until it's a full-on, wake the fuck up, red light nuclear meltdown. Eh, eh. Eh, eh, eh. That last one, that's when I know things are really bad. You see, we're a family of snoozers. I'll put it in proof. Set the alarm an hour before drop dead wake up deadline. Then snooze, 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 snooze. Come on, 10 minutes more. Okay, okay, just another one. Last call, I promise. And you know what? It works. This strategic psychological torture has ensured that in the 35 years my parents have been running a donut shop, they've never once just simply slept through a day of business. The idea that one morning they could possibly roll past one snooze too many and stay tucked in, soft, Swaddled warm, dreaming, while the mixer never hummed and the fryer sat cold, while the proofer never hissed and the glazer didn't run, while the blackened storefront faded in the empty darkness. No Edward Hopper painting come to life, no beacon in the night, while in disbelief they jiggled the locked door shut tight, while confused patrons pressed their noses at their own reflection, no, no, this notion doesn't exist, not even in another dimension. This isn't about sleeplessness, but rather the never having enoughness. So much so that normal waking hours, monumental life events were spent in slumber. My parents slept through birthdays and holidays, first days of school, first crushes and heartbreaks. They slept through my choir and band concerts, neighborhood block parties, parent-teacher conferences. They fell asleep in movie theaters and watching TV at home. You couldn't talk to them for very long on the phone. Except the 94 Northridge quake. That jolted them awake. They were asleep when the Twin Towers fell, when Osama bin Laden was assassinated, when the stocks bled out and the housing bubble burst. They slept through wildfires that choked our skies black and every single Donald Trump attack. They slept through presidential elections and the Capitol insurrection. They slept through the beginnings and ends of countless U.S. wars. But the one in Vietnam, they stayed up for that. Well, the donut shop didn't exist yet. And besides, how could anyone sleep through the carpet bombings that leveled village after village in rural Cambodia and Laos, which fueled the venom and the fire that gave rise to the communist Khmer Rouge? whose soldiers one day in April 1975 used fear to herd the entire capital, Phnom Penh, with the echoes of Paul Revere. 
The Americans are coming. The Americans are coming. They're going to bomb the Capitol. Leave now. Do not take anything with you. They told them they'd be back in two weeks. They were gone for four years. Two million people marched to their deaths, a living nightmare of enslavement, torture, toil. And oil burns, low returns, diabetes, chronic diseases, late nights, machination of sleep deprivation, a complicated equation to drive ourselves into an early grave of our own imagination. I wonder, did Pol Pot somehow reach decades into the future to devise this form of torture on Khmer people too? Did he know that this diaspora to America would become the undercurrent of California's donut culture? You may have escaped the war. You think you've gone to the promised land, but the regime's mark hangs heavy over your future. Success steeped in layers of confectioner's sugar. How can something so sweet be so bitter? They say 90% of Khmer Rouge survivors knew a family member or friend who was murdered. They say at one point, 85% of donut shops in California were owned by Cambodians. Same difference. Trauma passed down from generation to generation. Donut shops changing hands, family member to family member. When you're in a fog of toxins, it's hard to recall your breath in a cycle of violence and unrest. I can never forget. My favorite holiday for my parents to sleep through is Christmas. What a gift when the alarm doesn't go off at 2 a.m. When I was little, I would wake up early, tiptoe right up to their door, and savor the sound of their sleeping, knowing that for at least one day of the year, they stay tucked in, soft, swallowed warm, dreaming. Thank you. Holy shit. Yeah, that's what I'm about. <laughs> that was amazing. Whew. I've, I've also had the privilege of hearing a little bit more about the book you're writing, too. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, next up, we have Stefan Leva. No, sorry, my phone just. <laughs> hey, this is my first time, too, just so you all know. I've never hosted an event before, so there's a. Uh, Bound to be a couple of hiccups. Thank you for sticking with me. Stefan Leva is a first year MFA student in the creative writing program with a focus in fiction. Stefan specializes in queer young adult fiction, frequent, frequenting comedy and romance as much as possible. He was born and raised in Fresno and enjoys reading, video games, drawing on his tablet, and spending time with his cat, Victor. Great name for a cat. Welcome, to Stefan. Hello, everybody. I hope you're having a good time tonight. Um, the following is a snippet from my original short story titled, It Was All Yellow, a story about a high school senior named Kieran who is preparing for his senior prom with his group of friends. He battles the dilemma of whether to confess his romantic feelings for his best friend, Lev, where the potential of different college plans threatens to separate them. The following takes place the night of prom where Kieran prepares to accompany Lev on the ride to the venue along with Lev's date. The next couple of weeks fly by, a whirlwind of wrapping up classes, shopping for prom outfits, acting normal around Lev. Now we've reached prom night and I'm getting ready at home. My mom went out with her boyfriend for date night but made me promise to take plenty of pictures while also checking in with Aubrey. She secured the group's entire wardrobe, fashionable and more importantly, affordable. She put together a black suit with a purple shirt, black bow tie, and a fake orchid in the shirt pocket. I'm looking at my full body mirror, trying to fix my bangs to the best of my ability. Lev is supposed to come by and pick me up. Then we'll head to Cindy's and get her and her friends. He insisted I come along, claiming that he wanted a friend with him among her group. I reluctantly agreed, although I'm dreading watching him take endless pictures with Cindy while I awkwardly step to the side, wishing it were me instead. In the middle of fiddling with my hair, I hear the doorbell ring. 
followed by quick knocking. I collect my anxiety, exhale, and walk to answer the door. I open it and see Lev, not dressed up, instead wearing a casual flannel with a My Chemical Romance shirt. He wears a wide-eyed expression along with it. Why aren't you wearing your tux? I ask, confused. Lev answers by holding up an envelope. I got my letter, he says. Can we open it now? I should say we should wait until after prom, but I share his anticipation and gesture for him to come inside. We head into my room, unashamedly messy. Lev's is worse, so he doesn't mind. I quickly make the bed for us to sit on, and Lev is browsing my vinyls next to my record player. He pulls one out. You mind if I play this? To calm the nerves. Go ahead, I reply. He's picked Parachutes by Coldplay, gifted to me from him for Christmas. We've gone back and forth on deciding what their best album is. I'm standing for Parachutes, and he's chosen Viva La Vida. Considering I don't have the latter, he probably chose Parachutes because he's in the mood for Coldplay, or just a chill mood during a serious moment. After I turn on a lamp, I sit on the bed, Lev choosing to sit across from me. I grab my letter from my nightstand and we sit in silence for a second. You look incredible, he says. I love what you did with your hair. I give a half smile. Thanks, I say, thinking if I should ask why he's not dressed. Ready? Lev asks. I slowly nod, considerably not ready, but it's now or never. We rip open our envelopes and take out the letters. I tentatively unfold it and scan the letter. Thank you for your application. After careful consideration, the selection committee is unable to. The tension releases from my body, but it's replaced with a pain in my chest. I lower the paper to look at Lev, who is breathing heavy with a slight smile. He catches me staring. What does yours say? I hand him my letter without a word, and he gives me his. I read it, deciding not to go further after I see the first word. Congratulations. Lev's positive expression fades, and he gives me a concerned look. Kieran. Congrats, I make out. I knew you could do it. Kieran, there's still a chance you can get in. Plenty of people make it from the wait list. I can barely hear him, the sadness swelling up in me. I blink back tears, which prompts Lev to pull me into a hug. I bury my face into his shoulder, gripping his back. It's okay, Kieran, it's okay, he rubs the back of my head. It's not the end of the world. We could still go local. You can't keep changing your plans just for me, I speak softly. He sighs. I don't want to leave you. His words ignite a spark in me, and I can't hold it back. I have to tell you something. I pull away from him, wiping my eyes. He looks as uneasy as I feel. I close my eyes, trying to gather some bravery. It's not the dance floor with the shimmering lights, rather a room filled with junk, lit up by a single shitty lamp. But this moment feels right, the now or never moment. Kieran, is everything okay? Lev asks cautiously. I nod, taking a deep breath. Exhale and open my eyes. I'm finally ready. I avert my eyes, afraid to see his reaction. Lev, I like you. A lot. Like more than a friend. I've really enjoyed being friends with you all these years. And somewhere along the way, I got this feeling. The feeling that I want to be with you for as long as I can. Nobody gets me like you do. I feel like myself when I'm with you. I feel loved by you, and I hope you do too. I look down, rubbing my hands together. I, I love you, Lev. You're my person, and I want to be yours too. Heart pounding in my ears, I dare to look up at him. He's taking it all in, face changing from confusion to contemplation, then relaxing to a chuckle. Huh. You don't have to respond or anything. We can pretend like this never happened. I just wanted to say it before it's, it was too late, before you leave or date someone else, I insist. I feel like I'm suffocating in this suit, in this room. Lev doesn't say anything, then rolls his head onto his shoulder. Kieran, do you remember when Aubrey asked you what my favorite color was? Confused by how this could possibly be relevant, I nod. Miko was right, I didn't have a favorite color. But when you said yellow, it felt right, so I agreed to it. He smiles fondly. Ever since, I see yellow in everything. I love it so much. I want to live in it. Right now, it's the exact same feeling. He pushes back his hair, which falls immediately back into his face. I hadn't thought about us like that before. But when you said I'm your person and you want to be mine, we make eye contact. 
I've never wanted anything more in my life. A rush of relief flows in me. The suffocation is gone and I can breathe. It feels like the air after the rain, clean and fresh. My heart is still pounding, but instead of anxiety, it's excitement. I'm fluttering on the inside, trying to take in every part of this moment. The way my room looks, the dim lighting, what we're wearing, Lev's blue eyes, the fact I haven't taken my eyes off them since his last line. My hand feels heavy for some reason, and when I look down, Lev's is gently holding it. I never realized it happened, not just the hand holding, but the fact we've always been reaching for each other. We finally put it into words. Thank you. Such great like specificity in that. It was wonderful. Fake orchid in the shirt pocket. This details are incredible. It's hard to believe we're hearing from first years. Uh, the next one up is Taylor Seal Seals is a first year MFA student braving the poetry route emphasized in literary editing and publishing. In exploring the vast intersections of poetry and creative nonfiction, her writing centralizes external and internal human relationships. Many of the themes Taylor excavates in her work tackle black American generational trauma, familial connections, interpersonal bonds, and BIPOC queer romantic experiences. Taylor spends most of her free time taking three hour long naps, watching Bob's Burgers, and embracing all of her rough drafts. Taylor, I fall asleep to Bob's Burgers every night. <laughs> Thank you, Jefferson, for the adjustment, and thank you all so much for being here. Um, I have some poetry for you today. Um, much of the work that I'm uh, sharing with you today centralizes something I've been thinking about, which is my maternal relationships. Um, yeah, my maternal relationships. I think my mom and my grandmother and my late grandmother on my mother's side have been coming up a lot in my mind, and they've been coming up a lot in my work, too, so thank you. Um, the first poem I have for you today is called On Hands. On hands. I'm not very fond of my own hands. Their thickness too much of broken branches, curved around the knuckles like fallen sticks. The wood so jagged it meets the ground at each tip. Once, I obsessed over the muffled pop they would make every time I curled one fist into the other palm. Uncle says I have hands like my dad, and I've been troubled by the resemblance. Dad's hands have always been huge to me. Thick digits that move clumsily and assurance, yet eager and prompted punishment. Rough and ashen from years of pulling triggers, starting fires. I wonder of their softness before his father's passing, how the stiff Velcro of them was maybe once like fluid velvet. Maybe mom rounded his calluses out at one point, trying to keep them soft. Her hands have always been beautiful to me. Wide palms that spread into piano thin fingers, like wands and talons, her half-bitten nails, never glossed with polish, the base of each finger rarely peaks a hair. Nowadays, they have more scars than freckles. My sister's hands are a beautiful mix of our parents, with mom's almond tips, dad's heavy palms, warm despite their roughness, solid and used to lifting the weight of the world. Yet the way she holds her baby boy, with a careful thumb stroking his cheek, cradling his doughy wrist, Mellow, patient, and soft in all the ways he's taught her to be. She gets it from Grandma, too, whose tender joints are stiffening, even with her red, polished nails. Despite the aches, swells, aging pains, Grandma never misses a chance to smooth out any jagged edges. She's cared for others her whole life. Warm still grows in her fingertips, and my comfort starts in her palms. The next one I have is called Dear Hair, um, and it's kind of a uh, pairing with my first poem. Um, Dear Hair, I thought I hated you, the loudness of your curls, the coconut grease at your roots. I tried so many times to hide you under rough-knit cheap beanies and unkind brushes, hoping you'd disappear close enough to the scalp to remain unnoticed forever. In elementary school, 
when the pale boy's blurred face scrunched in confusion or disgust, asking why the beeswax mama used to hold the style of your braids in place looked like spider webs, I twitched at the tips to cover you, to hide the pretty bun the cornrows trailed into at the back of your head, the same bun you spent vain minutes in the mirror smiling at, feeling beautiful. I thought I wanted you to look like everyone else, chemical perm straight and flat iron burnt ends worth the uncomfortable illusion of fitting in, but I like the way you always feel like home, like cloudy soft early Sunday mornings, unraveling the bandana so the world could see you crowned, slicked back, cornrowed, flat iron, silk press braided down, I like the way you smell, like hand warm cocoa butter oil, blue magic shine, mama's cigarettes, melon tinted conditioner and hot honey beeswax, tenderly pleated onto the scalp, combed into zigzag, neat zigzag rows or curved hearts. I like the grease you leave behind my ears, mama's glossy fingertips trailing neck and forehead, baptizing me in routine between her pillowy thighs. I love your curls, coiled tight to the scalp and snow falling to naked shoulders, lover's bed sheets and shower dreams. I love the way you magic shape-shifting under heavy soft hands, making music with rainbow beads, boiled water curls, and brown baited waterfalls. Always yours, hands. Um, this next one is sort of in the spirit of rough drafts. Um, I know, you know, as first year MFA students, we're working towards um, our accumulating thesis at the very end, and we're always in this process of revising and workshopping and working on new things. And so this piece um, is something that I literally worked on just minutes before coming here. It's not even finished, but I'm very proud of it, and I kind of want to share it. So this is called What She Dreams Of Now. Somewhere, there's a photo of my grandmother of my mother's mother, tightly hugged in a slimmed down red dress that drapes her middle shins and teases the bends of her wrists. She's sitting on dark wooden boxes blended into the noir background, one hand crooked to sink into the curved plush of her hip, while the other comfortably dangles from an elbow rested on taller boxes to the side. She's smiling, bare face except for the natural golden rose glow of her round cheeks under the studio lights. Her shadow black hair is short, yet coiffed in silk curtain curls that frame her face, like Ella Fitzgerald or Lena Horn, all beauty and grace and poise, or maybe more like the silent, soft waves of the night sea. Mama said my grandmother didn't sing, she sang. Her voice reverberated, shook the walls of her childhood home in the treble of blues and the bass of soul. She sang when she cooked bubbling oil for creole fried chicken and steamed collard greens. She sang on cleaning days, always in tune with the murky water and her raisining hands. Grandma sang with her children every Sunday morning to the background gospel of the choir. Mama said it was almost always better than whenever she spoke mean words, carried on the pianissimo of her resentment, the occasional crescendo of her forgotten dreams. That's how she learned to sing. My mama can sing. <laughs> Voice wrapped proud in the cool rhythm and blues of Anita Baker or Whitney Houston on her own cleaning days. I remember her singing a forte over the stereo on the way to church, believing her an angel all on her own within the halo of her voice. She'd sing to me, she'd sing me to bed in sweet atonal lullabies, lyrics made up on the spot by a mother in love. Mama sang to herself in the loneliness of the night, the legato of her sorrow settling into the too often cold spot in her bed. It was always better than whenever she stopped singing, her alto octave falling into the decrescendo of her unhappy matrimony, the occasional trill of her abandoned love. And that's where I stopped. <laughs> It always amazes me when someone can meditate on one thing and find, just mine it over and over and over again and, and find new meaning and, and new ways to describe it. Next up, we have Miguel Angeles. Uh, he's a first year MFA student. He writes sad poems about being a fat queer 
Mexicano in conservative California. He likes scary, weird things, cats, and Prosecco. That's fine. What's up? Oh, sorry, no. Um, anyway, sorry, I was telling somebody that like, if I could make it down here without dying, that I would be fine. Um, but yes, yeah, so my name is Miguel. Um, I'm going to share a few poems with you. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the first poem I'm going to share is called You Find a Butter Knife Beneath Your Pillow by a J. Dodd and Aurora Massam Javed. Your mom asks from the passenger seat, orange branches reaching as you coast by, ¿A qué hora te dormiste anoche? You roll your heavy, yeah, <clears throat> you roll your heavy lidden eyes as if night were over, sun and moon both missing from the morning sky. A las doce you lie. What does she know of your insomnia? All the things you swallow during the day that keep coming up. Once after you tried to hug her and she turned away, you coughed up black buttons from her cardigan. Once after a fight with your brother or over flora and foliage you cut that he didn't ask you to, you tremored with palm leaves, foxtails, and pensamiento petals up your throat. Once at work, it was paper clip staples and the whiteboard marker caps that marked your monster visor, taking credit for the presentation you created and delivered while she took her daughter to school. This morning, after startling to uh, moth brush, excuse me, after startling to toothbrush bristles, coffee grounds and diabetic strips from an argument over where you wanted to breakfast, you want to look over and ask, Yustadama, what did you cough up this morning? Instead, you look ahead and ask, derecho, derecha, and wait for her response at the intersection. <clears throat> uh, my next poem is called Elegy for Brother. I'm just gonna hold this because it's not working. I tried singing, um, and this is after Cassandra Lopez. I tried singing you on into the other world, let you go, give you the sending you deserved, but I never learned to pluck your name out of my stars. Tu hermano, Tonantzin, spread wide across your back para vencer todo mal que cruce tu camino. I tried singing you on into the other world. You, brother, because tattooed Mexicans are the lowest class. Nobody cared about all the ways your body became a crime. I never learned to pluck your name out of my stars. Tu hermano, whom I strangered so easily for my shame, Por tu jotería jamás negada, and mine, I too afraid to own. I tried singing you on into the other world. You, brother, who made mother weeping, wailing woman, made me Cassandra, broken prophet, all lies. I never learned to pluck your name out of my stars. Tu hermano, more father than father, missing bricks of my golden path. I tried singing you on into the other world. I just never learned how to pluck your name out of my stars. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, the next poem is uh, my attempt to not be sad, but probably is. <laughs> um, it's called Red Violet. Pedrito muy coqueto with his smile, and I can't help but bore into his eyes. Pitayas a xolotl un panteón, and all I have and all I give is wrong. When we first met, he came as a surprise, an ocean torch arising from the spume. A flame, a light, red, violet, tender sun, and I, a massive star consuming wraith. We took us in not knowing what we'd wake, and unbeknownst to us, we are a flood. Relampagos, medusas, girasol, our limbs entwined, repulse, divide, define. Our needs, our wants remind us both to breathe. The life death gem we shape, beloved child. <clears throat> and my last poem, I'm going to read. Um, this is my Taylor Swift poem. <laughs> it's called Swift Amine. The drum beats, trumpets hit without a hint. The spinning starts and I can't stand my ground. All out of Swift Amine to ease the quakes. I close my eyes and hope it passes quick. When I first heard the beat, I twitched for hours. Roberto laughed, his eyes were bubbly, pink. No way to fight the urge to sing and dance and wretch and rage and jump and butterfly. 
A flaming liar sinking ocean depths. Got nothing in my brain but reputar. I'm turning to a white girl with each play of poppy songs that burrow through my mind. Some unicorns devouring my soul, but I, I, I can't shake it off. Can't shake it off. Thank you. That was fantastic. Love that. Such juxtaposition in there. Coughed up black buttons. Man, I was. Whew. I'm honestly completely blown away tonight. I know, like, we have to stay at, uh, stand up here and say nice things, but like, I'm I'm literally blown away by every reading I've heard so far. So, really appreciate you all. Our next reader is Angelina Lianos. Angelina, born and raised in Oxnard, California. Is a, in, is a Ventura County Youth Poet Laureate Emeritus and a first-year MFA student at Fresno State. Outside of school, Angelina serves as a Poetry Out Loud coach and a poet teacher mentoring youth in poetry recitation and creative writing. A second-generation Mexican-American, she writes of her unique relationship to both aspects of her culture as well as the intersectionality of ethnicity and sexuality. Welcome, Angelina. Okay, hi everyone. Oh my god, there's so many of us. Um, that makes me happy, but also nervous. Um, so, one figure who's super prominent in my writing is my great-grandfather. And it's very unique because I never really got to know him, but I attended his funeral. So, it's something I write about a lot and I'm exploring. So, uh, yeah, he'll come up in several of my poems. And this first one is very rough, actually. I wrote it a couple days ago. So I'm kind of just reading it as it came out, but yeah. I imagine my bisabuelo on the porch of a relative I can only simplify as someone's tío and picture him in a rocking chair, legs before they were corrupted by gangrena, eyes still wide enough to fall upon me like snow. And I wonder if he will hold me like a grudge to die with or a smoke to savor before the river comes to swallow him too? What dream could he embrace if it ever resembled my name? No, he has lived through more guerras than one man ever needs. He has no need for dreams, only the rocking of his chair, gentle crater, gentle cradle of my name on his tongue. All right, and this next one is also entitled. Bisabuelo, acuerdas de mi? Su bisnieta, the poet who honors you every single day. Bisabuelo, are my poems migrants to the country of your death? My voice granted a visa to the land I do not belong to. Do you tell the angels about me? Or do they eavesdrop on my prayers, sonnets de Sempasuchil, rosario of prose? Do they bless my pen to be a maker of memorials, to help you live forever even after you've passed? Or do they turn away from me too, smite me an imposter, and tear my pages with their teeth? Bisabuelo, when heaven puts up its fronteras and claims that I'm unwelcome, won't you take hold of my pen and show me the way back to you? All right, so one more grief poem before we move on. Um, I'm not sure how to grieve someone you never knew yet. I can only count knowing his name so far, Valentin. I only recognize him from stories shared at family gatherings, when everyone is so drunk that they forget how much it hurts that they lost him. Sometimes the pain even lingers because I know the ones who talk most are the ones who never got to say goodbye. I heard he loved to make pan dulce, bread so sacred that its secret recipes were never allowed to be passed down, even after he passed in his hometown. 
They say he went so far as locking himself in that kitchen so no one could sneak in and ruin an hechizo he whispered into each ingredient he used. I wonder if that's why I hold my poems close, as if someone else could ruin that too. All the words I'm not ready to share with the world yet, and how much I resemble the pages, maybe too white, maybe too light, to be claimed to. Did you know I searched my tongue so much for fragments of my second language, asking Google, como se dice, insert English. I wish I could have talked to you. Sometimes I simply wonder what I, if what I feel is valid enough, even if I didn't know him. And sometimes I still blame myself for not doing more to know him. My mother used to say, never take anything for granted, and yet she never prepared me for this. And did you know I used to pray every single night that he would get better, just so I could find the right words to tell him everything I'm still trying to tell my grandparents. But when that day comes, I will tell him everything that I need to. Okay, that's it. <laughs> and this last one came from a workshop back in the summer and it was completely revised. So this one is one of my favorites and very complete. So it's called, They Tried to Bury Us. The girl I want to marry tells me she's not enough to protect me from the cruelty of a world that tolerates before tossing away some of us, like a tongue born and buried in the same day. And sometimes the world says, there is no room for bodies like you. But me? I'm a river of words unafraid to jump fences. I will not let my legacy be buried before my story's been written. My lover and I will be gardens of this, gardeners of this earth that washes away our voices like stains. We will be the ones to plant sonnets in the soil, scatter elegies in the sea, and bloom bodies where there are tombs. At least I, of all people, know power by her figure, even when she is absent. Thank you. I think you're lying when you say you just wrote those. I don't know. I'm not sure I believe that. It's amazing. Oh, such a such reflection. Our next reader is Anthony Shamaria. Anthony is an MFA poet in the Creative Writing Program at Fresno State. He received his BA in Creative Writing from University of California, Riverside, with a minor in English. A native of the coasts of Central and Northern California, Anthony loves fog, a hoodie, and cold weather. He lives with his partner, their cat of chaos, and a probably sleeping dog. Welcome, Anthony. Hello. I have to set a timer, because, yeah, I don't really, <laughs> I will go over. Um, Hey everybody, yeah, so my, my bio is really pretty basic. I'm just gonna let you know, um, pretty much all my poems have to do with what it was like being an alcoholic. So, um, yeah, just keep that in mind. If I can remember how to use my phone. All right, here we go. So yeah. So these first few poems are all sort of tied to each other around the same theme. So I tend to write, recently I've been writing a lot about sort of like childhood alcoholism because I started really young. These poems are more about sort of life at the end. So um, yeah, I'll start with these and then we'll see where we go from there. Break a glass bottle. And of course, it is empty. I drink fast and the lagoon is spinning. My feet can't hold me in place. I sit over the cement side. I wonder if I thought then about how dangerous it would be to fall in. My memories try to reach for where I started. When the bottle slips, I feel nothing. But I hear 
as glass becomes ripples, rebounding streetlight off moss-covered night. This one's tiled, made conscious by smell. I can't smell farther than the cigarette smoke in my nostrils, the odor of my body stitched at the edges. I want to smell relief as I search the black fringe, resin staining my fingers, asking, what have I been doing in my car? A mildew factory, the orange foam ripped, seats puff stale plastic mites. I breathe in deeply, forcing down panic. I want to remember weed and newly filled plastic, smells of freedom, breaking the seal on a rum bottle. Let's see. Uh, we're going to fast forward in time. <laughs> this poem is titled, My First Day Sober. My first day sober, I walked into rehab. My feet untethered, dragging roots stripped from a tempest. The Napa River swelled with undrunk wine barrels ripe for nights of blurred fantasy. Levees whipped and cracked into green foamed waters. Later, I went to a meeting. I said my name was Anthony. I felt the thunder without sound. I shivered as the rain fell, hard, thinking I don't know how to float. Plenty of time. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll do this one next. Uh, I just wrote this poem, so in the theme. Um, it's about, yeah, when I was a kid, I, I tried to sort of do all these things to get outside of myself that weren't drinking. Um, so one time I decided it'd be really cool to like throw myself down a canyon if that makes sense. So this is about that. Um, it's called Fast Root on Sharp Margins. I lived on a cul-de-sac at the bottom of a cul-de-sac where I once put on two pairs of sweatpants and two hoodies. I shuttled my small hands into long sleeves. My head pulled tight in two. Sets of knots, the pinhole lens, drawn strings focusing the afternoon. I climbed down over the wild growth of a dead flower bed, hovering above a thin dirt path, the edge of a canyon floor unseen through trees and brush, the path hemming a hillside covered in razor sharp green, pampas grass so thick, I never heard a creature shuffling through my childhood. I had decided to slide down those sharp margins, a fast and short route, I would reach the bottom in seconds rather than treacherous minutes that felt like hours slipping on the runoff paths carved throughout the years. That was the first time I cracked my tailbone from a fall out of my control, seeing the world through a keyhole. Okay. Should we do a fun poem? <laughs> I have to drink water for this. So I wrote this a while ago um, before I sort of was like comfortable sort of writing about myself, so I made up a character. Um, <laughs> so this one is titled, Someone Enjoying Earth. There is someone knocking at my door. There is my cat enjoying what little time it has left on this cosmic mistake called Earth. There is someone, full of epic sadness, plucking up what is now stuck under the mattress. This crumpled note in my hand is not my sadness. A bill from Bill the Landlord for unforeseen damages caused by tenant malfeasant. A new nickname I am sure to share with Susanna tonight. But no, this, a sadness caused by my cat Yoshi in a fit of not giving a fuck, determined to ruin my life's routineness. She decided to take the pound of weed Carl's friend Robbie gave me after hitting on me at a party and discovering that he would hate for me to be homeless. 
and dragged it under the bed where my soulmate, the lovely rat turd, unpacked it with her teensy demon claws and rolled around in it like it was some sort of miracle catnip dry shampoo. There is someone knocking. There is my cat enjoying this cosmic mistake. There is epic sadness stuck under my mattress. This is not the first time my rent has been late or that I won't get my deposit back. I care about preventative care as much as as much as my <laughs> preventative care of my lodgings the same way I care about my body with careful disdain. What I do care about is making these tiny piles of cannabis into one large pile that will be close enough to a pound to sell before Carl asks me about the rent again. What I do care about is what used to be a radically saleable pound going back into its cellophane carcass. There is someone. There is my cat enjoying earth. There is sadness. Me, next to my mattress, it, upside down in a corner of my floor, bending my now surely more broken bed frame. Me, bending to pull hairs out of buds and buds out of carpet. Tiny piles, I'd like to introduce you to my friend. Larger pile. I need a Ziploc bag. I don't have a Ziploc bag. Do I have any bags? Flee to search. Cupboard, no. Drawer, no. Pantry, no. Cupboard, yes. A yellowing, cracked plastic Tupperware it my ex once used for potato salad. Is someone knocking? Is my cat enjoying this? Is sad as my life's journey? Or, open your door, you have my key. No. My roommate Carl wants the rent. Carl, do you have any cellophane or a Ziploc baggy, Carl? I'm not desperate, Carl. Yes, Carl, I have our rent on time. No, Carl, I didn't leave the water on in the bathroom till it spilled onto the floor, ruining our neighbor's ceiling. Sorry, Carl. Busy, Carl. There, my door. There, my cat. There, my sadness. Did I have sex with Robbie? Carl. Ew, never. Carl is into Robbie. Robbie, where's Robbie's number? Uh, hi, Robbie. Can I come over? Pause. Will you, you'll be home in an hour. Pause. You missed me. Pause. Okay, Robbie, see you home. Hang up. Pants. Wear our pants. Thank you. <laughs> That's my time. Thank you very much. Hell yeah. Someone who writes a lot about recovery, you're doing it very well, my friend, with humor, but also realness. All right. Our cleanup hitter tonight is Fua Li, who is a Hmong American writer. She likes 3 a.m. sodas and can be bribed with chocolate cake. Good to know. Her writing has been published in Asian American Writers Workshop, Stoneboat Literary Journal, Break Bread, and Poets.org, among others. Please welcome Fua. Testing. Um, yeah, that's good. Thank you, Jefferson. Um, so last year at the Rogue Fest, I found out that I spit a lot when I read. So um, Sharon, <laughs> just a little heads up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'll be reading a flash fic piece. And it is never, let's talk so we can understand each other. And always... You have issues with me. The one condition is it goes unresolved because queer mom daughter is Zhe, and Zhe is just a teenage girl. Mom teaches her that egg girls should be rolled tight. They taste better that way, and men like them like that too. But Zhe is thinking about girls, and one time one asked to hold hands during a school field trip. It felt sweaty, but good. And one time at school is asked about what or who she masturbates to. And at home is asked why no boys like her. But all she can think about is tight egg rolls and their glass noodle insides. How they're packed, then thrown into bubbling oil. And girls, she's thinking about girls. Their insides, the thrust into the world that breaks them. One time she runs away from home and finds herself in a cigarette stubbed lot in the linky moon following her. The lot will be empty. She will think she sees a dead girl's body in a ditch. She will run in circles until she finds a porch with a light on. She will hide under blankets and think about the girl she saw and what the girl saw, sky, so much sky 
She will know what it means and be jealous for it. There will be an alive girl, and just one time, Zoe will let the girl kiss her without overthinking it. It will happen at the Hmong New Year's Festival in the triangle shade of a papaya pause, a papaya salad stall, a current of red goldfish staining their teeth. The static bubbles over and her skin tingles. All she thinks about is how another person can swallow you, but still make you feel so whole. Now she knows for sure, but uncertainty still sits in her stomach like graveyards that can never really leave her. They will clasp hands and balloon through the crowded alleyway of booths, dip under hanging plushies and silver lock sow, and chip tooth grannies humming over mugwort and dried bark. Their ball toss will be magical because who says a ball toss must be between boys and girls? Briefly, she will weigh the peony embroidered ball in her hand, and in the next, it'll be eating air, rainbowing into girl's hand, like passing words between tongues. She will return to mom just in time for the upcoming stage performance of a folk dance, and mom will say, I saw a girl who looks like you. Her heart will stutter, but mom will continue. But her ankles were slimmer, and men wooed her with earrings, and Zoe will reach up to pinch her smooth earlobe. Twenty girls parasol on stage, their pair of blossom skirts beating back wolf whistles, and hot damn, I can see under her skirt. Suddenly, Zoe can feel her legs, how they stick to the wooden bench. Suddenly, twenty girls on stage metamorphose into forty legs, and she can't stop looking, and guilt bubbles up thick and hot like wheat fields. The sky heartburns over, and it's time to go home. The moon is a wheel tonight, and it is a water mill at the back of her throat, dredging bits and pieces unrecognizable, but so much like laughter that she's buoyant off it. She chases BB bullets with her teen cousin, who disappeared after he was outed. After noon light mosaicing his face into a lantern that eats the light, then holds it. There he is, the kick of his heel, the towel of his elbow. There it is, the mountain saddled back with wax flowers, the one he will soon noose and throw over his shoulder. Where are you? Where did you go? And where and where and where? He goes riding with the wind slicing through fish belly light, throws over his shoulder, I know too. And really, we're all just waiting for you to say it. Years later, his body will float up cold. She wonders if it was the love that did him in, so full of it he sunk. And if he's floating now, she hopes that meant he got to take it with him. Aunts and uncles will welcome him home one last time. He comes back the same way he left. Eyes closed, only this time, without tears. Mom receives a midnight phone call, a distressed auntie blabbering, I saw his ghost standing under the bridge. I swear I saw it, his chest traffic light red like a fiend. That's only half true. On a corduroy night in a house folded into the corners of small town America, Zell receives a midnight phone call. His voice statics like electric rain. Go chasing the wind. You have seen the newborn sun. She guesses that ghosts appear to you the way that you love them. Thank you. Yeah.